Are there advantages to having ADHD? You read the title, let's talk about it. The short version is yes. And we're gonna look at the sort of key insights from this book, um, a, a Hunter in a Farmer's World. Before we do that, just a little bit of context. From a visual pun intended wider perspective, I am not a mental health professional. I have a master's degree in bioethics and I was somewhat recently diagnosed with ADHD. So I read all six of these books about ADHD. I have too much hair product in and now I feel like a caricature of the which was, which was, um, ADHD, how to ADHD, the YouTube channel did a really good deep dive breakdown of different representations of people with ADD in media. And one of them is the people who just like jump, 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 jump. And they're like kind of over the top and ridiculous. And um, the reason that I like her breakdown of that is because most of the time we are masking and we are trying to hide everything about uh, what our brains are naturally like. I do that a lot less on this channel, but I just wanna, from the outset, explain that I'm not, I'm not a psychologist. Um, the previous video that we discussed what happens when experts disagree, um, these two experts kind of have different opinions on medication, I talk about it in the previous video. That video is not on YouTube yet because it's vertical and I'm not quite sure what to do with vertical um, content on the internet. The next video that I plan to do is about this book, Dirty Laundry, and it's about the deep shame associated with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is a lot of syllables. But for today, I wanna to focus um, on this one, specifically Tom Hartman's book, A Hunter in a Farmer's World. Let's get into it. The central uh, metaphor in this book is that there is a difference between hunters and farmers. Farmers are um, best when they can routinely do the same thing every single year, year after year after year, and they do best when they can plan far into the future and save certain seeds um, to plant in the next harvest. But hunters are, they do best. Hunters do best when they are making quick decisions and they're in high stress, high focus, high adrenaline environments. One of the elements of ADHD that is you know, discussed and common in all of the books is impulsivity, is jumping from thing to thing, making snap decisions, and sort of pulling the trigger on a maybe regrettable decision relatively quickly. Um, in a farmer's world, we see impulsivity as bad, but in a hunter's world, metaphorically, making a decision quickly can be the difference between um, catching uh, dinner for the night and not catching dinner for the night. And if we switch to the sort of non-metaphorical world of the real world, where in some context we call things impulsivity, in other contexts we would call that decisiveness. Starting to see what the metaphor is? There are lots of contexts where being able to be decisive quickly can be good. There's business context and there's um, like high stress environment context. In fact, one of the things um, that comes up specifically in this book is that we are, people with ADHD are very oriented towards high stimulation and um, being in high stakes environments can actually be one of the only places where we are super focused. It's part of why we get away with doing papers at the last minute because we're so freaking stressed out that our brain finally kicks into a gear that we can use. That ability to be focused in a crisis is not a bad thing. It is a morally neutral personality attribute that can become good if it is put in the right context. An ambulance driver uh, a paramedic, a business person, etc., etc., etc. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I have this public bookshelf. I have to be mindful of what is on here. I do have a private bookshelf, um, titles that I, for whatever reason, don't feel like exposing to the public. But there is one title on that shelf that I feel comfortable sharing because it's so relevant to what we're discussing, which is the book Upstream by Mary Oliver. In the book Upstream by Mary Oliver, there is an essay called On Power and Time, where she discusses creativity versus <laughs> like regularity and ordinariness in a really useful analogy. I don't wanna give you an exact quote, but just pulling from memory, she gives the case of an airline pilot. You want an airline pilot to be much more like a farmer than a hunter. You do not want him to be creatively or her creatively trying out new things. You want the airline pilot to do it the exact same way every time. And genetically, in terms of differences in human personality, you want the airline pilot to enjoy and take satisfaction in the ordinariness and the regularity of their position. People often misread Darwin. Um, there's a book, Why Fish Don't Exist, which is about genetics and <laughs> eugenics, and it's a personal memoir. It's really good for a whole lot of reasons. But one of the things that I learned is the fundamental way that we misread Darwin. And we often, in our understanding of uh, sort of, <clears throat> uh, what's the phrase? Um, blanking on the phrase, the scent with modification. That's not it, it's a different phrase. Um, 
survival of the fittest. It's survival of the fittest. One of the ways that we misread the concept of survival of the fittest is that there is a hierarchy and that some ways of existing genetically are better than others. This is the root of a lot of really dark philosophies that exist in the world. The concept of white supremacy is based on this idea that there are genetic hierarchies. But this is, Lulu Miller argues, and many people have argued over time, a fundamental misreading of Darwin, because part of what we need as a species, as any species needs, is genetic diversity. We, it is not better to be a farmer or better to be a hunter. We need both kinds of personalities, um, genetically, sociologically, interpersonally, and we will not have a world with any creativity or art if every personality type is an air traffic controller or a pilot and we have no impulsive, creative sorts of souls. I read a lot of books by um, this guy, Ned Hallowell, Edward Hallowell and John Rady. Um, they work together a lot and they've had a lot of useful work. But one of the phrases that they, and actually now that I'm mentioning it, since we're primed to be in a book of video, video based on that ADHD on a channel by Books Guy, if you're interested in such things, um, Ned Hallowell actually wrote chapter, whatever number that is, in Harvard Business <laughs> Reviews on Managing Yourself that I read for a past life when I had a completely different job. Whatever. Um, the, the analogy that he uses is to say, uh, if you're telling a kid that they're, they've been diagnosed with this, don't tell them that their brain is broken, <laughs> um, that they are uh, like just disordered, uh, but instead tell them, uh, in an analogy the kids will understand, that you have a race car brain with uh, the brakes of a bicycle. <laughs> our speed and our intensity is a tremendous asset if we can use it in a productive way. I'm self-conscious of the fact that I'm looking at my record button and it looks like I have shifty eyes. I'm not trying to signal shiftiness. I just have to press this button sometimes, sorry. So where Hallowell says that you are a you have a race car brain with bicycle brakes. Um, Tom Hartman says that you are a hunter in a farmer's world. And Mary Oliver says that you are a creative, impulsive soul in a world that values the skills of pilots. Two things before the video ends. What does Elizabeth Barnes say? What do I say? And then end of the video, because I've been talking for too long. Riffing off Lulu Miller and how people fundamentally misread Darwin in our understanding of diversity and neurodiversity. Um, in my bioethics degree, I read snippets of this book, The Minority Body by Elizabeth Barnes. The key insight from this book that is worth sharing with you is something that is referred to as, you know, imagine big text animations here, the mere difference model of disability. What is that? Um, I'm gonna just give you a real short version because this video is already longer than I was planning. Um, and then we're just, gonna, we're just gonna wrap this up. The shortest version of the claim is that if there were ramps everywhere and elevators instead of stairs, it wouldn't matter that there were people in wheelchairs. Just zooming in on this for a second, Elizabeth Barnes argues compellingly that disability is primarily a social phenomenon. It's how we interact with each other that causes the difference that is instead of just having mere differences, we have disabilities. Is this true? Honestly, I don't know. And I think it's important to see, just because I have a microphone and camera and all these things, um, it's just, it's important to see people on the internet who are experts on stuff. And it's important to see people on the internet who recognize that their expertise has edges. Um, the last thing that I will say about this, just if it seems counterintuitive, is that there have been historical examples of places that have a lot of deaf people in the population. Everyone knows sign language and deafness isn't really a disability at all. It's the social structures around us that create um, the appearance of disability as opposed to just mere differences. Um, that makes a lot of intuitive sense to me um, in my understanding of ADHD. Is ADHD a disability or is it, uh, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know any of these things. I just thought that you should be aware. I will also link the accounts of a creator called Crutches and Spice who pushes my thinking on disability and just straight up knows more than I do. Okay, conclusion. I discussed in my previous video that sometimes experts disagree on things. That's okay, that's the natural progression of fields. But there are advantages to having a kind of chaos brain that is called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, it is not necessarily a bad difference, but a mere difference, um, which is a reframing that is necessary. Why? Because um, the world is designed for, uh, the, well, we'll get, to, because of the next video, because the next video is about shame um, and the deep shame that people uh, live with when we have lives uh, where we constantly fail at things. <laughs> um, and I don't wanna say this in like a glib, happy influencer book sky tone. Um, the deep shame associated with going through life and constantly not being able to do things in the way that is expected of you um, has a significant enough impact on mental health that it is 
sometimes uh, confused with depression. Um, okay. <laughs> I will talk to you more in the next video. If you're still here, consider joining my Patreon, Obligatory Influencer Things. I sell these books on my, um, I don't sell them, Amazon sells them. I have an affiliate uh, place link in my reading tree linked by whatever, the, you know what it's called. Click the buttons. Okay, thanks for watching. I'm Charlie. Does that make sense to me? Talk to you in the next one. Bye.